Good afternoon, my name is Kyle Reyes, and I serve as a special assistant to the President for Inclusion here at Utah Valley University. It is my honor to welcome you to the 21st annual UVU Martin Luther King Jr. Commemoration. Our theme for this year is Remember. Civil rights activists of the past, including Dr. King, risked their reputations, freedom, and even lives to bring awareness to this country. Awareness of inequality, injustice, and intolerance. What do we remember of that history? How do we remember those who stood bravely and sacrificed for change? To begin our program this afternoon, we have invited UVU's voice line to perform some of the music from the civil rights movement. Following their performance, we will be honored to hear from our keynote presenter, legendary civil rights activist, Joan Trempauer Mulholland. Ms. Trempauer Mulholland participated in over three dozen sit-ins and protests and was put on death row in Mississippi's notorious Parchman Penitentiary with other Freedom Riders. She was involved in one of the most famous and violent sit-ins of the movement at the Jackson Woolworth lunch counter and helped plan and organize the march on Washington. For her actions, she was disowned by her family, attacked, shot at, cursed at, and hunted down by the Klan for execution. As a white Southern woman, Joan's courage and fortitude in the movement is highly regarded and recognized. She has been written about in several books, including Growing Up in Mississippi, Breach of Peace, and We Shall Not Be Moved. She has appeared on numerous television and news programs, and her story and experiences were highlighted in award-winning documentaries, including An Ordinary Hero, PBS's Freedom Riders, Standing on My Sister's Shoulders, and the groundbreaking film Eyes on the Prize. Now, before we hear from our wonderful guest, please help me welcome to the stage UVU's voice line to open our commemoration.
My mother never told me the stories. All I ever knew were the pictures. In 2011, on the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rides, I returned to Mississippi with my mother. It was there, and in subsequent interviews, that her entire story would begin to unfold. Her great-grandparents were Georgia slave owners, but after the war, the family was reduced to sharecropping and chicken thieving. Her mother moved to Washington, D.C. and married the only foreigner in the family, a Yankee. In 1941, my mother was born. But when her mother suddenly became ill, she was raised by a black woman for the first couple of months of her life. I tell you this because her mother didn't like black people, and her family, like most whites in the South at that time, believed that no matter how bad things might be, at least you weren't black. And that's the world my mother grew up in, where family discussions of Leo Frank's lynch mob passing by her aunt's house weren't based on whether lynching was right or wrong, but if he was guilty or not. This was the South, after all, and segregation and racism were a way of life. But one day this girl, Mary, I think her name was, that, that lived down the road, she and I would, would play together every summer and we decided to sort of dare at each other to go walk through Nigger Town, which was down by the Coca-Cola bottling plant and a road led off on the other side of the tracks. It went through the black area and everybody just sort of seemed to disappear into their houses or the back of their houses when these two little white girls were walking through. No one spoke to us, no one bothered us. They just made themselves invisible. I think that's when things really hit me as to how unequal they were and how unfair. Joan was very aware that she was a Southerner and she knew what that meant. And she loved the South, she loved being a Southerner. Uh, however, when, she, when her eyes were open to what it meant to be a Southerner in this day and age, in the 1950s, to recognize the, the huge divide in, in uh, economic status between the two races, uh, she began to really wonder how am I, as an individual, going to change this? And I know it's, it's somewhat uh, alarming, really, to think that a nine or a 10-year-old could begin to think that way, but that is exactly where her mind began to go. She didn't like what she saw. She realized it needed to be changed, and she realized somebody had to do it. Uh, she went home and started questioning a lot of things that her mother took for granted, and it began to open up a divide, actually, between mother and daughter. When Joan began to not only participate in meetings where these things were discussed, but what actually went down uh, to the Raleigh-Durham uh, uh, city and began to actually sit in with uh, the black students, uh, she was not only branded as a radical, they thought she was out of her mind. A Southern white woman doing this kind of thing, the only explanation was that she was mentally ill. And she was taken into uh, for uh, some oversight. They talked to her quite a bit uh, after her first arrest. Um, they insisted that she call her parents and let them know what was going on. And uh, she was certainly taken to task by the Duke uh, administrators uh, about what she was doing. I knew that what I was doing was in keeping with my understanding of Christianity and the foundation of the country with the Declaration of Independence. But at the same time, I knew it was against the way of life that virtually all the relatives I knew believed in. And that you know, the sentiment, the only thing worse than a nigger is a nigger lover, um, would apply, that I would be out of the family. But there was the advantage that once you took the fatal step of stepping outside the bounds of acceptability, there was no stepping back, so you could only go forward. 
And that I think that helped some of us white Southerners to just keep, keep on keeping on. We had no place to go back to. But the movement became family. And black kids sometimes could not go back home either because not that their parents disowned them, but because it was not safe. They were asked not to come back. They knew they could be killed. They knew their parents could be killed or their home burned down or you know one thing and the next. So for a lot of us, there was no turning back. Joan was considered uh, the segregationist's worst nightmare. The whole concept that somehow you know, something could happen between this white uh, woman and these black men on campus was a big concern of the authorities in Mississippi. And in fact, it was an attempt to shut down Tougaloo as a result of this reverse integration that was going on. She wasn't the outside agitator. She was a white Southerner. She was a white Southern woman. And so for that purpose, she was even more dangerous to the white supremacist power structure because she was one of their own. She was one of their own who grew up to see that the system was wrong and she rejected it and she actively opposed it. And not only that, in, in addition, it probably shouldn't be underestimated the fact that she was a woman. And of course, white supremacy for hundred for at least 100 years had used white women as an excuse for the violence that they enacted upon black men. So here's this white woman who is supposed to be protected by white supremacy, who is supposed to be, uh, be the one that Jim Crow keeps these um, black beast rapists and these, these people, uh, Jim Crow is meant to protect her. It, Here's this white Southern woman who's supposed to be protected by the system saying, I don't need this protection and I don't believe in the system. And so that made her incredibly dangerous, a huge threat to that power structure. By the end of her first year at Tougaloo, Joan was accepted on campus. She was getting to become part of the fabric of the, of the campus life. Um, she leaves and goes back home. Uh, her parents had uh, attempted to reconcile with her and frankly were dangling a European vacation in front of her as a way of getting her away from the South. And hopefully, once they got her out of the South, hopefully they would you know, keep her out of the South. So she accepted this, uh, this little junket uh, uh, off to Europe for that summer and apparently had a grand time, but when it was time to go back to school, she went right back to Tougaloo in the fall of 1962. And interestingly, right at that point, there was a new movement developing. Uh, John Salter, uh, one of the professors on campus, uh, had begun working with Medgar Evers, the head of the NAACP, to develop a student movement that would eventually rock the foundations of the city of Jackson and the state of Mississippi. I've heard at various times from the reporter, the cameraman, and the son of one of the reporters that this was the most terrifying, frightening event they covered in the civil rights movement. Now, I guess they weren't in Birmingham or Montgomery with the Freedom Riders, but they got around, and um, this to them was the worst. When we had seen Memphis kicked in the head, I uh, had blood coming out of his nose and ears, which is not a scratch. Uh, anything could have happened to anybody. Joan sees all this and realizes, first of all, she is beginning to communicate with the, the demonstrator. She's, she sees a man with a knife walk by Ann Moody, and she calls out, um, Annie, he's got a knife. Um, and all of a sudden, she's identified with the people at the counter. <laughs> Who is this white girl talking to those black girls, you know? So all of a sudden, she realizes that she's in danger. But then I sat down. That's when I became a problem. She walked through that mob in the war store. And they realized, of course, immediately where she stood. She joins Perlina and Annie at the counter, the first white to join the demonstration. And at this, the crowd is just incensed. They become like hornets. They start screaming at her, you black bitch, you black, you, you white nigger, you, uh, you know, uh, traitor, um, communist. 
yelling, screaming, cursing, laughing, a lot of loud laughter, dirty jokes being cracked, racist remarks. Um, anytime people went to the counter, though, it was like the, the crowd, the mob, really turned into an animal, just an angry roar when they realized someone else was not afraid of them. One of the white guys who was in league with Benny Oliver uh, grabs Joan uh, and pulls her off the stool. Another one grabs Annie Mooney and pulls her off and drags them to the back of the store and out the door. Uh, Joan, it, it's interesting, um, she kept her composure and once outside of the store, what we see is this white, tough guy pulling on a white Southern girl. And the police arrest the guy and let Joan go back in the store. So he is arrested and carted off, and she's let to go back in the store. Annie is standing right there at the entrance. Somewhere she's lost her shoes, but they're both okay. And they both decide that they're safer if they get back to Perlina and back to the counter. So that's what they do. They, they make their way back through a throng of a couple of hundred people by this point, back to the counter. I went immediately to the lunch counter to sit with Joan and Annie Moody. A white man, mistaking me identity-wise and mission-wise, yelled out, hit him hard, boy, hit him. But then I sat down with them, and the crowd was quiet for just one moment, and then I heard my name mentioned by somebody. And then they moved in on me. At that point, Joan has said that she believed that they were not going to make it out alive, none of them. We're going to make it out alive. I think I was beyond fear. I think I was driven by determination to carry this through. And by the time we sat at the counter a while, it was like an out-of-body experience that the real me had left the body, and it was just a shell there. And the real me was sort of up above, like a guardian angel, um, letting me know what was happening and protecting me to some extent. But the real essence of me, the important part, was already out of there. I think the best way to put it is that it was a very interesting afternoon, uh, to put it mildly. But we had no idea of the implications. One immediate implication was that instead of just a few hundred people coming to a mass meeting, uh, there were almost a thousand. And it's the first time that Black Jackson really rises up and says, we're going to support this movement. And it's a major turning point in, in the, the movement in Jackson. The following two weeks turn into a demonstration after demonstration and begin to open up uh, the city of Jackson uh, becomes more and more tense situation with the mayor and the city council and the folks who are trying to negotiate on the side of, uh, of the black populace. Um, it ultimately ends, unfortunately, with the assassination of Medgar Evers. Medgar Evers, the head of the NAACP in Mississippi, was shot in the back by Byron De La Beckwith while standing in his driveway. In his hands were fundraiser t-shirts that read, Jim Crow must go. I think Medgar, to me, represents all the people who died uh, gaining freedom. He was one I knew. I could have been killed. He was. Apparently, the Klan had a poster. I've never seen it, but I've talked to people who have. People. Uh, who were the Klan's most wanted list, like the FBI had the 10 most wanted. And when somebody was killed, their face was X'd out. Mine never got X'd out, and Makers did. I'm here in Washington. I live, what, three miles from Arlington Cemetery. So whenever um, I'm in town on his, the day he, was, he died, I try to get by his grave. A lot of years I haven't made it. A lot of years I have, and increasingly I have. Um, 
And increasingly, I find other people are making it just by the number of flowers and uh, stones that are left at his grave. And I feel like when I go to Medgar's grave, it's sort of like giving thanks to him for his sacrifice, um, giving a report to him, sort of going. It focuses my thoughts on what went before and what's happening now. I think that's um, why my reaction to his uh, Obama's election was, I've got to go to Medgar's grave. Partly to update things. Um, and reflect on him, and uh, partly to give thanks to Medgar. We're here to remember Dr. King, not me. Hands up. Don't shoot. Don't shoot in Ferguson. Don't shoot in Cleveland or Fairfax County, Virginia. Don't shoot in Saratoga Springs. But why do they shoot? In Ferguson, they said, I thought he was going for my gun. 50 years ago, precipitating the Selma to Montgomery march, Jimmy Lee Jackson was shot in Marion, Alabama. And what did the policeman say? I thought he was going for my gun. The more things change, the more they stay the same. There is this underlying racism behind it. We've destroyed the superstructure built on that, the work of Dr. King and the thousands of others who followed him in Montgomery, in Washington, in Atlanta, in Albany, Georgia, and in Selma. They destroyed the superstructure of laws and restrictions and customs that kept people away from each other. But there's that underlying foundation, that rock hard foundation on which the superstructure was built. We'll call it racism, and we haven't destroyed that. We need to get out our pickaxes and eliminate that racism. We need to get to know each other. We need just to see each other as people. Maybe you say, oh, I'm not a racist. But when you hear an accent, when you see a name, when you see a face, do you already have an idea about that person? I do. Just a couple days ago, I met this sort of slightly darker complected gentleman. He's Palestinian. He had one of those checkered scarves around his neck. Did I say, hello, glad to meet you? No, I said, assalamu alaikum. Then he told me he worked at the church with my son. Ha, huh. well, was I embarrassed? Yes, but he took it okay. But I had this assumption that he was Muslim, which is fine, but he wasn't. I gave him the wrong greeting. Yeah, I stereotype. Maybe I'm a racist still. And I think that's probably true of every single one of us, including my son, the filmmaker. Loki, wave, wave your hand. Hey. You just saw 15, maybe 20 minutes, we you know these technological difficulties. Technology is wonderful when it works. But it really is an hour and a half movie that he tricked me into. Now, you younger folks out there, don't forget how to manipulate your parents. It's a life skill, just like tying your shoes. <laughs> yes. 
That film was supposed to be about all these folks in the civil rights movement that you've never heard of, that it wasn't just Dr. King and Rosa Parks. What did the film turn out to be? Yeah, after I'd given him the contact information, but he does have a lot of those other folks in it. Dr. King was a leader. In our country, we go for symbols. Somebody who stands for, some, or something that stands for something else. Dr. King was a worthy person to choose as the symbol for the civil rights movement and the changes we were trying to achieve. And I'm gonna move over here, because I can't see these people. I could see y'all okay. But this, the other half of the room, Dr. King could speak in a way that the folks in the most rural Baptist church could relate to. He could also go to the fanciest universities in the country or into the White House and relate to the person there. He's an excellent symbol. But there were the thousands of others marching over that bridge in Selma and on to Montgomery that we must not forget. And it's always that way. George Washington did not win the Revolutionary War single-handedly. He had troops and troops and more troops behind him. We know the names of the generals. We know the names of the kings. Ad nauseum when I was in school. But we didn't really understand the people. And we must keep it that way for any movement in this country. And we still need more movements. We've come over the years to recognize and call out by name problems in our society and in our world that we didn't name back then. There is hunger. There is gender discrimination, gender identity discrimination. There are weapons that shouldn't be out there. You name it, there are problems we have not faced or are just beginning to. Let me read you a little bit from King's speech when he got to Montgomery. I like it a lot better than his I Have a Dream speech. His I Have a Dream speech is wonderful to explain the goals of the day, the, what we wanted to achieve. But the students back then, and you know how students are, we just say, oh, he's just dreaming. He's, you know, pie in the sky, his head's in the clouds. What's he going to do? We need some action. So, toward the end of his speech, get this paper clip off. He said, let us continue our triumphant march. They've just come from Selma to Montgomery, and he's standing on the steps of the state capitol where Governor George Wallace hangs out. Let us continue our triumphant march to the realization of the American dream. Let us march on segregated housing until every ghetto or social and economic depression dissolves and Negroes and whites live side by side in decent, safe, and sanitary housing. Let us march on segregated schools until every vestige of segregated and inferior education becomes a thing of the past. Let us march on poverty until no American parent has to skip a meal so that their children may eat. March on poverty until no man walks the streets of our cities and towns in search of jobs that do not exist. Let us march on ballot boxes until race baiters disappear from the political arena let us march on ballot boxes until we send to our city councils, state legislatures, and the United States Congress 
men who will not fear to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with their God. Let us march on ballot boxes until brotherhood becomes more than a meaningless word in an opening prayer, but the order of the day on every legislative agenda. And I plead with you this afternoon as we go ahead, remain committed to nonviolence. The end we seek is a society at peace with itself, a society that can live with its conscience. And that will be a day not of white man, not of the black man. That will be a day of man as man. To me, that is ever so much more powerful than I have a dream. It's a call to action. He's outlining the problems and saying what we must work for. And saying, go for it. The disappointing fact is that 50 years later, we can go to see a movie about all of it, and a good movie, but we haven't reached those ends. I was just at a brunch for a few of us here, and people were talking about the leftover food. And is there a way that when there's leftover food, we can get it to people that need food? Why should it all go in the dumpster? In the schools, the best equipped schools are in the richest communities. The poor communities, they may not be getting their textbooks out of a pile thrown on the floor of discards, but they still don't have the funding to provide adequately for their students. We still don't see one another as just another person. We get into that stereotyping, like I do, jumping to conclusions. And the vote, we're moving backwards. More and more laws that restrict who is able to vote. They're cutting down on the hours at the polling booth and advanced voting. They're making it harder for people, more and more ID. I went to vote in the neighborhood where I have lived for 40 years and have known the person who's at the desk where you walk up and they check you off, showed him an ID. He said, yeah, that'll work, but you gotta have your driver's license next time you come to vote because the law has changed. Tighter and tighter restrictions. And if you're an old person without good transportation, 30 miles out, and the hours of when you can go to get that ID and you gotta pay an ever increasing fee for it, it disenfranchises you, every much as the poll tax used to. How far have we come? So I charge all of you to go out there and do something about some of it. Tomorrow would have been Dr. King's birthday. Don't wait till Monday to do something. Do it on his birthday. And then do it again on the holiday. And over the weekend, I'm not quite sure what you're gonna do, but pray for all of us. Yeah, I like to tell the grade school kids, and it probably holds true for you too, about the ripple effect. You know those grade school kids, they like to throw a stone in a pond and or a puddle and watch the ripples go out. They don't know how far it's gonna go, they're watching. Well, when you identify what's upsetting you, like King did, do something, a small thing. That's okay. There's no telling how far those ripple effects of your actions will go. There were a group of students at North Carolina A&T College in Greensboro. 
And they had gotten sick and tired, as Fanny Lou Hamer said, of being sick and tired of going to Woolworths, buying their school supplies, buying their toiletries, maybe even buying a birthday card for their mamas. They were tired of their money being green at Woolworths when they were doing that. But if they wanted to go over and get a hot dog or a hamburger or a piece of pie, couldn't do it. Same store, money was still the same, but it wasn't welcome at the lunch counter. And they complained and complained. And four of them said, they came up with a plan of action. We're gonna go sit down at that lunch counter and we're not getting up till they serve us. Four guys quit griping and took action. And within weeks, the sit-ins had spread across the entire South. Thousands and thousands and thousands of other students were doing it. Thanks to the power of the press, if there's any of the press here, you're my heroes, because you take the message to the world. Those students brought change. Then the next year came the Freedom Rides, testing the recent decision of the Supreme Court of the United States that the facilities associated with interstate travel had to be open to everybody equally. All oh, back in the 40s, they had ruled the means of conveyance, the bus or train couldn't be segregated. That was honored in the breach. But now the ruling was, in late 60, that the terminals, the water fountains, the ticket booths, everything had to be open equally. The Freedom Rides were testing that, but they were stopped in Alabama with a bus burning on Mother's Day and a mob at that was in Anniston, Alabama, and in Birmingham, there was a mob. The original Freedom Riders could not continue. They were too badly beaten up and hospitalized. But students who had been sitting in, in Washington, D.C., in Nashville, Tennessee, in Atlanta, Georgia, in New Orleans, Louisiana, they came to Alabama to keep those buses and trains rolling. Well, when they got out of jail, and yeah, it got so crowded in the local jail, they had to clear the prisoners off death row, move them to another place in the prison, and put the Freedom Riders on death row. When they, some of them got out of jail, they stayed in Mississippi to work on voter registration. I'm not on voter registration, on community organizing, and they came to realize that you've got to be able to control who is elected, the ballot box if you're really gonna change the laws and the police enforcement. So they switched to voter registration as their primary focus, moved some, literally some of the same students who had been sitting in early on, moved over into Alabama, the area around Selma, Lowndes County, you know that area, what they called the Black Belt, and worked on voter registration. That led to the march on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the beating that was so bad that John Lewis, one of those sit-in students, head was you know, trampled, beat. It led to Lyndon Johnson, as only a Southern president could do, going on national TV to, before Congress, saying he was a Voting Rights Act leaning into the camera and saying, and we shall overcome, knowing it was the death knell of the Southern Democratic Party that had propelled him to the presidency, leading to the Voting Rights Act, leading to the federal registrars, leading to more black elected officials in Mississippi than any state in the union, leading to the first black elected governor in the history of the United States, my own Doug Wilder, and leading on to the president today, who has acknowledged the direct link back to those four guys in North Carolina. You just never know where that ripple effect will go. 
So my charge to you in the memory of Dr. King, tomorrow on his real birthday and Monday on the holiday is to do some even small thing and see where the, wait and see where the ripples will go. As King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Our job, all of us, is to help it bend. Thank you. To close this portion of our commemoration, let's welcome UVU Voiceline back to the stage, and thank you all for coming. One, two, three. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.